Good morning, everyone. Thank you for making it to this event on a rare but not totally out of the ordinary snowy day in April. My name is Ashley Sheff, and I'm a senior political science and pre-law student here at Damon. I am also a member of Damon's NCAA Division II track and field and women's triathlon teams. <laughs> this spring, I am fulfilling my internship in Senator Gillibrand's Buffalo office. It is truly my pleasure to welcome you to Damon Athletics National Girls and Women in Sports Day. We have a great hour planned for you. To get us started, please welcome Associate Professor of Business Law and Sports Management and Damon's Director of Athletics, Bridget Nyland. Good morning, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for everyone being here, like we said. But, and Ashley, actually, just so you know, in the typical life of a student athlete, just flew back from Orlando last yesterday where she competed with the triathlon team. Ashley, you won, didn't you? Second. Second, second overall. Second overall, number one in the age group. So my comments will be really short, uh, but I just want to frame this week in general and this morning in particular. Uh, this is the fifth consecutive year at Damon College that we have celebrated women in sport. The celebration itself was started 30 years ago by the Women's Sports Foundation. I first celebrated this event as a UB student athlete. Watch my UB, woo My UB friends here. Um, and it's the, it's the time of the academic year where we just take a pause from the craziness of what academic and college life is like to recognize the many benefits that sports bring to women on our campus, specifically the young women who participate in varsity athletics, club sports, or are studying in the college's sports management or athletic training programs. As we move farther and farther away from 1972, the year in which Title IX was adopted, the law that made all of our particip participation possible, it becomes increasingly easier for us to forget that, that there was a point in time when women didn't have the right to the participation that we now have, let alone the opportunities that come with that participation. As one of a limited number of college women athletics directors in the country, I can tell you there's still much progress to be made in terms of gender equity in athletics. But I'm reminded often by women in our community who are just a few years older than me that I have had the opportunities that were never available to them. And I can tell you, to the student athletes in the room, that you have had opportunities that I did not have. We truly stand on each other's shoulders in so many aspects of life, but in sport in particular. And that is why we of women of all ages come together this week to celebrate the friends we have made through sport, the lessons we have learned, and most importantly, to honor the opportunities that have helped us become stronger in body, mind, and especially spirit. So in terms of athletic spirit and a strong spirit at that, that is the context in which I would like to place our invitation to Senator Gillibrand to come to speak to you this morning. In September 2014, I was listening to her book, Off the Sidelines, on my iPod, and I chose the book for my own personal inspiration just for everything she's done and everything she balances. But I literally stopped there in the middle of my run when I reached the part of the book that discusses the role that sport had in her own life, a role I did not realize when I started following her as a congressman out of the Albany area. I immediately thought of how powerful this message would be for our women student athletes here at Damon. When I later reached the parts that touched upon issues such as society's fixations on women's appearance, sexual assaults on campus, and the myth of women having it all, we have it all, right, Bri? Yeah. <laughs> Kids got to school today a little late, but that's okay. Um, I realized that there were so many women who would greatly benefit from spending some time with you and hearing about your thoughts, or even just a few on a, just a few of these issues. So I'm not sure how we pulled it off, but we, on behalf of President Olson and my good friend Bobby Mills and Damon Athletics, first, thank you for accepting our invitation for spending some time with us. With that, I will shift it over because there's someone that we would like to introduce you. It's our Associate Dean and Title IX Officer, Dr. Kathy Boone. Thank you, Bridget. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to introduce our keynote speaker for today's kickoff to the Girls and Women in Sports Week at Damon College, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. I can think of no better national leader to preside over today's event than the Senator from New York. Since being sworn in as United States Senator in January of 2009, Senator Gillibrand instantly established herself as one of the nation's outstanding women leaders and a champion for the economic empowerment of women and working families. 
Her opportunity agenda includes provisions for paid family and medical leave, raising the minimum wage, making quality child care affordable, and ensuring equal pay for equal work. Most recently, Senator Gillibrand has led the national effort to address the issue of sexual assault on college campuses through her proposed Campus Accountability and Safety Act. And may I note that Damon was the first private college in the nation to endorse this legislation. <laughs> Senator Gillibrand has taken her rightful place as one of the nation's great woman leaders. Her impressive biography emphasizes the early influence of strong, independent, and politically astute women in her life. She is a role model for her two young children and for the young women student athletes whom we honor this week at Damon College. Perhaps her signature achievement is her exemplary leadership and work within the Armed Services Committee, the Agriculture Committee, and the Committee on Aging in what is perhaps the ultimate old boys club, the United States Senate. <laughs> we are proud to have her as our U.S. Senator and proud that she is with us today to kick off Damon's Girls and Women in Sports Week of Events, celebrating the academic and athletic accomplishments of women student athletes at Damon and at all colleges and universities throughout Western New York. Please join me in giving a warm Damon welcome to our Senator, Kirsten Gillibrand. Well, thank you all. I want to start by thanking Ashley for competing, for being a great athlete, and for being my intern. I'm very grateful. <laughs> um, I also want to thank Bridget uh, for inviting me. Uh, she's such an extraordinary leader and has a vision and a voice that I think is incredibly compelling. I'm very grateful that you made this suggestion and made this invitation, and I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank uh, President Olson and Dr. Kathy Boone as well for hosting me today and for giving this opportunity for me to talk to all of you as students and as leaders and as professors here. Um, I think you should feel very proud of all that you're achieving here at Damon College. Uh, as student athletes, you have worked so hard to balance your coursework along with your social lives, along with the hours and hours of training and competition that being uh, sports requires, being in sports requires. Um, your experience at this school is very special and you are going to have those experiences with you throughout your life and they will inform you. And I know this because my experiences as a college athlete really informed me. I played tennis uh, throughout uh, grade school and high school uh, and competed in tennis and when I went to Dartmouth I was excited to play on the tennis team. But I had this very interesting coach who was the women's squash coach come and watch me play tennis. And she said to me, you know, would you like to learn how to play squash? And I said, sure. And so off I go to the squash courts, which I did not know where they existed. I had never held a squash racket. I had not one, in, one piece of information about how to play. But I learned how to play. And the more I played, the more I liked it. And my coach, Aggie, said, I want you to be on our squash team. And so I made the very unusual shift from being a tennis player to a squash player in my freshman year and played varsity squash for four years. Now, um, squash, squash matches are not dissimilar from tennis matches. You have uh, uh, the top player play the top player on the other team. You have nine matches. And once I got the hang of the game, I played around four or five. And um, I did really well at four or five. Uh, I was comfortable there. But one time in my freshman year, my coach asked me to play number two. And she asked me to play number two against Yale. Now, I can't fully describe the difference between the level of play I had versus my opponent. It would be like any college any college pro or any you know local pro playing Serena Williams. That's the difference. I mean, it's it's really that severe. And so I'm on the court with this young woman and she's kicking my butt, like just hugely crushing me. And I can't handle it. I don't know what to do. I'd never been in a situation where I felt so outmatched. And so after the first game, I came off the court, I see my coach, and I burst into tears. And I look at Aggie and I say, Aggie, I can't do this. I can't. I, I don't know how to play this game. I can't possibly compete. And she said, Kirsten, 
all I want you to do is just play every point. Just focus on every single point. Can you do that for me? I said, yes, I can. Can you finish this match? Yes, I can. I just want you to do your best. Okay. And so off I go and I finished the match. And yes, I did not beat her. I, I continued to get crushed, but I got through the match. And for anyone who plays sports, this has happened to you before. You know, I've, I've won many matches in my life. In fact, by my senior year, I was um, undefeated at number four and five, undefeated the whole year. But what I remember most about my college career was that one match. And the reason why I remember it is because I learned something about myself. I learned about how to stick with it, how to never give up, how to play against all odds and know that it's important to stay in the game because that's who you are. And what you learn in life is that uh, you, will, you will never, um, it's never a terrible thing to compete and it's never a bad thing to fail. What's bad is to give up. What's ga bad is to quit. And so that's the difference. It's you, you have to keep playing. And I've applied that lesson throughout my whole life, uh, no matter what I've ever worked on. It's, it's been something I've worked on on legislation. You know, when I'm fighting against uh, the Department of Defense on changing how they address sexual assault in the military. I mean, that's a pretty big opponent, the entire Department of Defense. But it doesn't mean I'm going to give up because I know what it feels like to lose. And it's not that painful. What's really painful is when the cause that you care dear, dearest about, that you care the most about, no longer has a champion. And so that's why sports, I think, will continue to inform your life. Um, I think that uh, for uh, all of you here, when you graduate, you're going to be in a world that's very different than your caring and supportive college environment. And there's going to be realities that will set in that you will be really surprised. Uh, for a lot of the women here, I doubt you would even expect that you wouldn't earn the same amount of money as a male counterpart doing the exact same job. Would you think you'd earn the same amount, women here? You would assume you would, right? Yeah, OK, well, you won't. <laughs> Well, maybe not. Maybe you have one of those awesome employers that just does it right. Um, the statistics are great. For every dollar a man makes in the exact same job, a woman's going to make 79 cents. 79 cents. That's really horrible. And if you're a Latina or an African-American woman, it's even less. And so that is just a fact that, unfortunately, is part of our reality and something I fight very hard against. Um, there's a lot of other structural challenges, but what I'm really inspired about, though, is the women's soccer team fighting for equal pay for equal work. Do you not love the fact that Hope Solo and her whole team filed a federal lawsuit against the U.S. Soccer Feder Federation? I think it's really important. So I hope that when you're in your own career, you stick up for yourselves, too. Now, it's not always easy to go into your first job and say, I'd like a pay raise or I'd like to earn more. And sometimes you will actually be punished for that. But uh, it's worth it because you should know your value and you should always fight for your value and I think it's really important. Um, I also want to talk about um, your own voices and how important uh, your views and your values and your vision is so important to this country. Um, one of the issues that I'm working on so hard right now is campus sexual violence. But I want to tell you how I came upon that issue. As you know, I worked very long and hard going up against the Department of Defense on military violence. But two young women, uh, recent college graduates, came to my office, and they didn't have a meeting. Uh, and they said, "I want to, we want to speak to the senator." And so I sat down with them, and they told me this horrible story about how they were both raped on their college campus at different times, different years. Um, but they both reported their rapes, and not only were they disbelieved when they reported them, they were retaliated against by their school administrators for making it public. And these two women, instead of just accepting that was their fate, they decided to stand up and they filed Title IX complaints against their school. And not only did they file their own Title IX complaints, they then traveled across the country and stood with other survivors, men and women, who had experienced assault and made sure they were heard on the issue, filing their Title IX complaints. And so this is what advocacy is about. It's about taking a risk. It's about speaking from the heart. It's about demanding change because you believe in it so strongly. And I don't know what your issue will be. I don't know what your cause or passion will be. But whatever it is, you should follow your heart. Because your advocacy can literally make the difference between something changing and not changing. And for a lot of young women, you might assume, I'm sure someone else is doing it. I'm sure uh, someone else will take care of that. It's not necessarily true. 
And in the U.S. Senate, we only have 20 women senators. In the House of Representatives, we only have 18 percent women. So for a lot of issues that women might care about, they never make the top 10 list. You know, we are still struggling to get equal pay for equal work. We're still struggling to get affordable daycare and universal pre-K. We don't have paid leave in this country. We're literally the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't have paid leave. But there's a reason we don't. We only have 20 women in the U.S. Senate. I can promise you if we had 51 percent of women in Congress, things like whether women should have access to birth control would be a foregone conclusion. We wouldn't be debating the same issues that our mothers and our grandmothers had fought so hard to achieve. So fundamentally, your voices are really important. I hope every single one of you votes. I hope every single one of you advocates for changes that you want to see. And I hope you realize that your voice can literally change the world. So thank you all for inviting me. It's a delight to be here. And I think we're going to answer some questions, right? Good morning, Senator Gillibrand, and welcome to Damon College. I'm Rachel Pollack, a business, sport management, and pre-law student, and a member of the women's basketball team. My question is, at times, balancing academics and athletics in college can be tough and tiring. What benefits do you believe come from committing to the college student athlete experience? Uh, I think it makes you more resilient. I think you can handle ups and downs easier. Um, one of the studies I really like to cite um, is about whether women would see themselves running for office someday. And when you compare what young women say to what young men say, overwhelmingly the men think they will run for office someday. They can see themselves as mayors. They can see themselves as president. But the women, not so much. They just don't, they don't see themselves that way. But the only indicator that would lead a woman to be more likely than not to run for office is if she's played college sports uh, or high school sports. And my theory about that is that it's because she knows how to compete. She's not afraid to win or lose. She knows it's not that painful to lose because she's won and lost many times. And so for a lot of women looking at the prospect of do I want to run for office, the first thing they typically say is I don't want to run for office. I can't stand the negative ads. I don't want to put my family through that. I don't like how rough and tumble politics is. But if you're a woman who's played sports, you've been through rough and tumble. You know what it's like to compete. You know what it's like to win and lose. And you want to play the game. And so you're more likely than not to feel like I'm comfortable. Even though it might be a rough playing field, I'm comfortable. I can play there. Because women have no doubt about their abilities to make good decisions, to raise money, to run a good campaign, to pick the right issues. They're very confident in all those issues. Uh, they just don't necessarily like the negativity. And so we can overcome that through sports. And so I just think that that will help you throughout life, that that resiliency, that knowledge of what it's like to, and for example, if you're going to be a business owner or you're going to you know, grow up to have to negotiate a contract for yourself or be a lawyer, your ability to fight for yourself will be more enhanced because you've played sports. So I think it's great that you are putting the time in but also doing the tough balancing act of, of having a sport. The other nice thing about sports, I think, is the friendships you, you create. I mean, I had such wonderful friendships with my teammates. Uh, I loved, you know, traveling around the country, playing um, different matches against different schools. And so I think you just have this wonderful aspect of your college career that's unique and special. And I would encourage all women to play sports. Hi, Senator Gillibrand. My name is Moni Green. I'm a freshman here at Damon College. I'm studying physical therapy and I'm a member of the women's soccer team. Uh, my question for you today is, what kept you motivated during college in your early career paths and what keeps you motivated now today to tackle life's new challenges? Um, well, in college, uh, I think I was just motivated because I wanted to do well. I had, I had real goals. I had aspirations. I had ambitions. And one thing that sometimes young women aren't comfortable doing is embracing their ambitions. Sometimes we don't want to admit that we want to do something. So in, in college, I really wanted to go to law school. So I wanted to get good grades. I wanted to do well. Um, I wanted to have an enriching experience. I wound up being an Asian studies major. I went to China. I traveled across China uh, as a student. I learned how to speak uh, Mandarin. Um, and that was a really important experience, but I wanted to enrich myself in as many ways as I possibly could. And so I, I just had long-term goals. Um, now what keeps me going is when, when I particularly get discouraged is the causes that I'm fighting for. 
when I feel like there's no way to pass a bill on campus violence or on military sexual assault, I think of the survivors and I think how brave they are and how much courage it took them to stand up and demand action and to tell these horrible stories of the most painful parts of their lives, sometimes to the national news media. And so if they can have the strength to do it, I can have the strength to do it. And so I really draw a lot of strength from uh, the people I'm fighting for. Welcome to Damon, Senator Gillibrand. My name is Samara Colon, and I was a member of the women's basketball team here at Damon. I'll be graduating this May from Damon and start grad graduate school at the University of Buffalo and hopefully work in college athletics in the future. So many of us have aspirations to work in male-dominated industries. As one of only 20 female U.S. Senators, what advice can you provide those of us entering such industries? <laughs> so many bits of advice for you there. Um, so my first, my first uh, career was in the law. And the law, up until law school, is 50-50. In fact, more women graduate from law school than men. So we have educational parity in this country, and most young women will not experience any feelings of discrimination throughout their college or law school or advanced degree careers because we have parity. Uh, we, we actually graduate more advanced degrees than men. Um, but when you get in the workplace, you'll begin to see structural issues, and you have to fight them because they will impede you on some level at some point. So as a young lawyer, I didn't really think there was much sexism. I thought, mm, you know, my mother and my grandmother, they've, they've taken care of that for me. I'm set. I just, you know, my, my work will speak for itself. But by the time I was a fifth or sixth year associate, I started watching men make partner, but women not make partner. And I, I didn't understand because these women were amazing. They went to every fancy law school. They did great work. They had all different types of personalities, but they still weren't making partner. And it was a real structural imbalance that I just did not, believe could possibly be true. And then when I was a young uh, lawyer at a different firm, I realized that my colleague who had the same graduation year as me, the same kinds of clients, the same kind of background was being paid more. And his in law, you have a billing rate, how much, you know, whatever an hour you charge your client for the work you're doing. And he was being billed out higher than I was. And I said, I, I understand that. So I went to my the managing committee and said, I don't understand why he's being billed more than me. We have the same background, ex skills, experience. And they said, oh, it's just an oversight. We'll fix it. I said, oh, great, great. So they fix it. The next year, he's being billed out higher than me again. And I, I'm just baffled. And I go back to the hiring committee. I said, I know we talked about this last year, but could we fix this, please? Because I think it's, it's discriminatory. It's not fair. And they said, oh, no, of course, of course. I don't know how that. OK, the next year, the same thing. Yeah, truly. So I go to them, and, and they said no that third year. They said, no, we're going to leave it the way it is, without a reason. OK. Now, I was going to leave the firm in a few months to run for Congress, so I just left it. But that was outrageous. And, and that was at a firm where I'm well-respected, well-liked, but there's structural issues you've got to fight against. And so pay is one of them. The fact that we don't have paid leave is a huge problem. And, and I'll just describe it. You're not at the, at the age where it's as relevant yet. But when you choose to have children, or if you are, have aging parents, there's going to be times when you need to be with your mother. She might be dying of a, a cancer, or your father. There might be a time when you have a new infant. Um, but you're going to want to take some time off. Now, the best employers in the country offer paid leave. But it's only 11% of workers uh, get access to paid leave. And workers who have access to unpaid leave, most of them can't afford it. So having unpaid leave is not helpful. And so if you're a low-wage worker, you're totally screwed. And I'll explain that to you. If you're earning, and this was one of my employees. She, she, was, a, she was a waitress in a, in a local bar, and she, she's now running for Congress, actually. I'll tell you about her in a minute. But uh, she, she was a waitress, and she had no sick days and no vacation days. So when she got pregnant as a single mom, she had no choice but to quit because she had to be with her baby. She wanted to bond with her infant. She wanted to nurse. So she needed at least a few weeks. So she takes the time off. She has to go on Medicaid. She gets uh, money from WIC, which is Nutrition for Women and Infants. Uh, and then after she's had a chance to bond with her child, she has to go work for another low-wage job, starting at the bottom rung. We call this the sticky floor. She's stuck on the sticky floor. She can't get off it because every time there's a life event, whether it's a new baby or a sick parent or a sick family member, she needs to ramp off but has no sick days or vacation days to do it. But if she had paid leave, she could get her, her income during that time. Uh, be at home with her infant, and then be right back to her job where she had some seniority, where she'd had a good track record. And so 
But the fact that she doesn't have that, she never continues to reach her full potential in the workplace. So these are real structural challenges that are going to impede you no matter what your job is. And so we have to fight against those. Now, beyond that, some some professions, you'll have some general sexism. Um, and you just have to know what to expect and be able to navigate around it. It is reality. And uh, if you look at any statistic, any study, you'll see it. And one example is uh, a recent study about who's the most valuable employee, and they ranked them. The most valuable employee was a man with children because he needed, to re he needed to earn money for his kids. He'd be responsible. He'd show up to work. The second most valuable employee was a single woman. The third most valuable employee was a single man, and the least valuable employee was a woman with children because she would obviously have distractions. So that is just the reality of the landscape today on which you will play. And, and we just have to fight against that. And it's hard mm -hmm. because you may be discounted. Um, I know if uh, I was going into a new, inter a new job interview and I wanted a higher salary, some women will be seen as troublemakers. They'll be seen as rocking the boat, seen as, you know, she's high maintenance. Whereas a guy asking for a higher salary on that first day, he's going to be seen as he's bold. He's a decision maker. He's, you know, reflecting well on us. It's just the, the night and day difference between how we're perceived is a challenge. So just do your best, stay strong, believe in yourself, uh, know how smart you are, ask for the big job, and you might get it. So. Um, good morning, I'm Emily Radford, another first year student here at Damon, and I run cross country and track and field. Mm -hmm. My question is, the current political climate in the United States can be described as intense making it unattractive for women of all ages to enter an election or get involved with politics. Why is it important for young women today to get engaged in political activities or debate, and what advice can you give us as to how to civically discuss politics in these times? Hmm. <laughs> Interesting question. Uh, yeah, so you, you're quite right when you identified a reason why a lot of women don't get into politics. They don't like the nastiness. They don't like the rhetoric. They don't like the negative campaigning. And that has been proven. There was just a big study saying that was exactly the reason less women than men want to run for office. And so we have to overcome that, and uh, we have to really think through the fact that your life experience is very different than those who are running most governments and most countries and mo most companies, male leadership is dominant throughout the United States. So you have to really believe in yourself that your view of the world is not only different, but is important. And that if you are not speaking out on the issues you care about, then no one will be. If you're, the, if you are not there fighting for safe campuses or fighting for clean air, clean water, or fighting for whatever that issue that really compels you is, no one might be doing it. If Before I got to the US Senate, we really weren't holding the Department of Defense accountable for 20,000 rapes and sexual assaults every year. We, we really weren't. And we had heard the Secretary of Defense, since Dick Cheney was Secretary of Defense, that there was zero tolerance for sexual assault, but still every single year, 20,000 and large numbers like that of rapes, sexual assaults, and unwanted sexual contact. And the worst, in fact, is that of the brave souls who reported their rapes, 62% were retaliated for reporting. No justice is possible. So your views and your experience are unique and they're important, and you have to make sure they're heard, because if you don't, no one may fight for them. And you just have to know that, and that is important. And if we had, again, 51% of women in government uh, representing our views, the issues that would we, be, we would be dating, debating would be different, and the solutions that we'd be offering were different. And that complement of both male and female life experience is really powerful, and it would be a better set of issues we'd be fighting for if we had that diversity. Uh, we got time for one more question, just one more. Hello, Senator Gillibrand. My name is Rayanne Stewell, and I also am a member of the women's basketball team. Um, I'm currently a nursing student and taking a labor relations class. Uh, my question, I was actually um, blessed to have the longest question, so um, my question relates to labor relations, so bear with me. Uh, you briefly spoke about the five members of the women's soccer team having filed a wage discrimination complaint against U.S. soccer as the women's team makes 40% less than the men's team. The issue of wage disparity seems to be a pervasive issue and one that is very important to you. What is your strategy to further reduce the disparity and what can women in our society do to achieve pay equity in the workplace? 
So um, legislatively, I'm working on a bill, uh, the Equal Pay Act, that Barbara Mikulski wrote. Uh, right now, it's illegal to pay women less than men for the same job. It's discrimination. But there's no transparency or accountability, so companies get away with it really easy easily. So what we're trying to do is create um, a way to have more transparency. And the bill largely creates transparency mechanisms, rewarding companies for posting the salaries and the wages for all positions, regardless of gender, so that they can just catch themselves and, and actually have that transparency. Because right now, if you work in a big company, you might get fired if you were talking to a friend about how much do you get paid and how much does he get paid. And you could get fired for that. So it removes that ability of, of a company to retaliate against you for discussing pay. And it also creates incentives for transparency and accountability across um, industries. Um, what we can do as individuals is really just try to encourage our friends to fight for equal pay um, because a lot of times we need to be mentors to one another. We need to strengthen each other and, and shore up our confidence. And we need to fight for ourselves. And you just have to know, though, you might get retaliated against for doing that. So be aware. If you are the sole wage earner in your family and if you don't bring home that paycheck, your baby doesn't get food, you're not going to rock the boat because if you get fired, you're going to have to look for a job. That's really hard for you. But if you're in a place like I was at a law firm and if I wanted to create a big problem and quit that firm, I would have been fine. It's worth fighting for because I had the ability to take whatever consequence came. But for a lot of lower wage women, they have no ability to take a negative consequence, so they can't. So fight when you can and, and help others to fight when they can and, and really support each other because this is a long-term battle and you'll be shocked in different careers um, how discrimination plays out within that company or that field. Um, Women-owned businesses do really well Women-owned businesses are very good at setting a climate and setting a culture that is often very rewarding and very family-friendly. So looking at women-owned businesses as a place to work as a way you can just control your own future or start your own business. But there's impediments there, too. Women start their own businesses with seven times less capital than men do. And one of the reasons is all levers of financing are largely male dominated and, male, and white male controlled. So whether you're talking about banks or whether you're talking about hedge funds or whether you're talking about venture capital or angel investors, predominantly white male. And so human nature is such you see brilliance in yourself. And so that great idea for this woman who wants to have this cupcake shop that's going to be the best thing since sliced bread, he might not see the brilliance in that. Or he might not see the brilliance in the woman who wanted to create uh, sports bras. And now we have this amazing company that has millions of customers every year and she's got a billion dollar business. She had to go through something like I don't know, a dozen different investors before anybody would take her seriously because they were men and said, why would we want sports bras? Well, let me explain. <laughs> we need them. <laughs> so again, sometimes investors don't see the brilliance in a women-owned business's idea, but um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And, uh, and it's interesting. There's a woman who runs KeyBank in upstate New York, and she, uh, she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a target for myself. I want to spend a invest a billion dollars in women-owned businesses. She's well in excess of $5 billion, and it's among her fastest-growing portfolio of all her investments. So she's proved the case that these are good business ideas. They just need capital. So that's another way we can sort of own our own future, start our own business, or work for a women-owned business. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. This was very fun, and I'm grateful to get to have a chance. government rules kind of restrict what you can personally accept so but I have two things one you already know about but um, we have this tagline here at Damon uh, Ash I'm gonna ask you to stand up and, and our, our hashtag our, our thing is be fierce oh, I love it. so um, first I want to thank you for coming to Damon I want to thank the men in the room too because I know it was a little girl power day but you got us right you got us and you know and we love you too yeah. <laughs> the more that we succeed and for the young men in the room you're, you know, your your sisters, your moms, your girlfriends, your significant, whatever. You, you know, you, you. It's great that you're already here listening to some of these issues. So anyway, this is for your Buffalo office, wherever you want to call awesome. it. And so, and there's a great, the great line. In this first second, I know you got to go, but I want to read this because it reminded me of what we were looking at. It says, "So Kavita Ramdas, which is another person I would like our young ladies to, to look to, is the director of the Global Fund for Women. She's the largest foundation in the world supporting women human rights across all borders. She had this to say about women." We need women who are strong, are so strong they can be gentle. So educated, they can be humble. No, I love that about you, that you're mm -hmm. absolutely humble. Um, so fierce that they can be compassionate, and so passionate they can be rational, and so disciplined that they can be free. 
thank you for being all of those things. We hope you'll think of that. When you have your low moments, you see that and know that there's a group of people behind you. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you.